Hello, guys and gals, and this is part 12 of our reading of The Last Unicorn by Peter Beagle. Um, in the last episode, um, Smindrick, Molly Grew, and the unicorn, who's now human, Lady Am Amalthea, uh, made it inside the castle. They met with Prince Lear and um, King Haggard. And King Haggard was um, intrigued by Lady Amalthea's eyes, and he allowed them to stay in the castle. And uh, we made it to chapter 10, I believe. So we are going to pick it up from there. Um, let's put that to the side. Yeah, chapter 10. I'm not sure how many chapters there are, actually. But I do know there are 169 pages. So, And we are on page 104 currently. So, wait just a sec here. There we go. What can I do for you? Prince Lear asked. Nothing very much just now, Molly Grew said. The water was all I needed. Unless you want to peel the potatoes, which would be all right with me. No, I didn't mean that. I mean, yes, I will if you want me to. But I was talking about her. I mean, when I talk to her, that's what I keep asking. Sit down and peel me a few potatoes, Molly said. It will give you something to do with your hands. They were in the scullery a dank little room smelling strongly of rotting turnips and fermented beets. A dozen, a dozen earthenware dishes were piled in one corner and a very small fire was, sh was shivering underneath a tripod trying to boil a large pot of gray water. Molly sat at a rude table which was covered with potatoes, leeks, onions, peppers, carrots, and other vegetables, most of them limp and spotty. Prince Lear stood before her, rocking slowly along his feet and twisting his big, soft fingers together. I killed another dragon this morning, he said presently. That's nice, Molly answered. That's fine. How many does it... How many does that make now? Five. This one was smaller than the others, but it really gave me more trouble. I couldn't get near it on foot, so I had to go in with the lance, and my horse got pretty badly burned. It was funny about the horse. Molly interrupted him. Sit down, your highness, and stop doing that. I start to twitch all over just watching you. Prince Lear sat down opposite her. He drew a dagger from his belt and moodily began peeling potatoes. Molly regarded him with a slight, slow smile. I brought her the head, he said. She was in her chamber, and she, and she usually, oh, as she usually is. I dragged that head all the way up the stairs and laid at her feet. She sighed and nicked his she saw he sighed and nicked his finger with the dagger. Darn, I didn't I didn't mind that. All the way up the stairs it was a dragon's head, the proudest gift anyone can give anyone, but when she looked at it suddenly it became a sad, battered mess of scales and horns, grisly tongue bloody eyes. I felt like some country butcher who had brought his last a nice chunk of fresh meat as a token of his love. And then she looked at me, and I was sorry I had killed the thing. Sorry for killing a dragon. He slashed at a rubbery potato and wounded himself again. Cut away from yourself, not towards, Molly advised him. You know, I really think you could stop slaying dragons for the Lady Amalthea if five of them haven't moved her one more isn't likely to do it. Try something else. But what's left on earth that I haven't tried? Prince Lear demanded. I have swum four rivers, each in full flood, and none less than a mile wide. I've climbed seven mountains, never before climbed, slept three nights in the marsh of the hanged men, and walked alive out of the forest where the flowers burn your eyes and the nightingales sing poison. I have ended my betrothal to the princess I had agreed to marry, and if you don't think that was a her heroic deed, you don't know her mother. I have vanquished exactly fifteen black knights waiting, waiting by fifteen lords in their black pavilions, challenged all who come to cross, and I've long since lost count of the witches in the thorny woods, the giants, the demons disguised as damsels, the glass hills, fatal riddles, and terrible tasks, the magic apples, rings, lamps, 
potions, swords, cloaks, boots, neckties, and nightcaps, not to mention the winged horses, the basilisks, and sea serpents, and all the rest of the livestock. He raised his head, and the dark blue eyes were confused and sad. And all for nothing, he said, I cannot touch her, whatever I do. For her sake, I have become a hero. I, sleepy Lear, my father's sport and shame, but I might just as well have remained the dull fool I was. My great deeds mean nothing to her. Molly took up her own knife and began to slice the peppers. Then perhaps the Lady Amalfi is not to be won by great deeds. The prince stared at her, frowning in puzzlement. Is there another way to win a maiden? He, he asked earnestly. Molly, do you know another way? Will you tell me? Will you tell it to me? He leaned across the table to seize her hand. I like being brave well enough, but I will be a lazy coward again, if you think that would be better. The sight of her made me want to do battle with all evil and ugliness, but it also makes me want to sit still and be unhappy. What should I do, Molly? I don't know, she said, sudden, suddenly embarrassed. Kindness, courtesy, good works, that sort of thing. A good sense of humor. A small copper and ashes cat with a crooked, with a crooked ear jumped into her lap, purring thunderously and leaning against her hand. Hoping to change the subject, she asked, What about your horse? What was funny? But Prince Lear was staring at the little cat with the crooked ear. Why did he come from? Where did he come from? Is he yours? No, Molly said. I just feed him. I just I just feed him and hold him since sometimes she stroked the cat's thin throat and then closed its eyes. I thought he lived here. The prince shook his head. My father hates cats. He said that there is no such thing as a cat. It is just a shape that all manner of imps, hobs, and devilkins like to put on to gain easy entrance into homes of men. He, will, he would kill it if he knew you had it here. What about the horse, Molly asked. Prince Lear's face grew glum again. That was strange. When she took no delight in the gift itself, I thought, <coughs> I thought she might be interested to hear how it was won. So I told her about the view and, and the, the charge, you know, about the hissing and the naked, and the naked wings and the way dragons smell, especially on a rainy morning, and the way the black blood jumped at the point of my lance. But she heard none of it, not a word until I spoke of the rush of fire that nearly burned my poor horse's legs from under him. Then, oh, she, then, then, oh, then she came back from whatever she, from wherever she goes, and I talked to her, and she asks if she may go and see my horse. So I led her to the stable, where the poor brute stood crying with the pain. And she put her hand on him and his legs, and he stopped moaning. That's a terrible sound they make when they're really hurt. When they stop, it's like a song. The prince's dagger lay glinting among the potatoes. Outside, great gusts of rain growled, uh, growled round and round the castle walls. But there in the scullery... But those in the scullery could only hear it, for there was not a single window in the cold room, nor was there any light except for the meager glow of the cooking fire. It made the cat dozing in Molly's lap look like a, a heap of autumn leaves. And what happened then, she asked, when the Lady Amalthea touched your horse? Nothing happened, nothing at all, Prince Lear. Suddenly he seemed to become angry. He slammed his hand down on the table. And leeks and lentils leaped in all directions. Did you expect something to happen? She did. Oh. She did. Did you expect the beast's burns to heal on the instant, the cracked skin to knit the black flesh to be whole again? She did. By my hope of her, I swear it. And when his legs didn't grow well under her hand... Then she ran away. I don't know where she is now. His voice softened as he as he spoke, and the hand and the hand on the table curled sadly 
on its side. He rose and went to look into the pot o over the fire. It's boiling, he said, if you want to put the vegetables in it. She wept when my horse's legs did not heal. I heard her weeping, and yet there were no tears in her eyes. When she ran away, everything else was there, but no tears. Molly well, put the cat gently on the floor and began gathering the vegetable, the, the venerable vegetables for the pot. Prince Thur watched her as she moved back and forth around the table and across the dewy floor. She was singing. Let me plug this back in real quick. Okay. She was singing. If I danced with my feet as I dance with my dreaming, as graceful and gleaming as death in disguise, oh, that would be sweet, but, but then would I hunger to be ten years younger or wedded or wise. The princess, no, the prince said, Who is she, Molly? What kind of woman is it who believes, who knows, for I saw her face, who knows, for I saw her face, that she can cure wounds with a touch, and who weeps without tears? Molly went on about her work, still humming to herself. Any woman can weep without tears, she answered over her shoulder, and most can heal with their hands. It depends on the wound. She is a woman, your highness, and... That, and that's riddle enough. But the prince stood up to bar her way as she stopped, as she stopped, her apron full of herbs and her hair trailing into her eyes. Prince Lear's face bent towards hers, older by five dragons, but handsome and silly. Still, he said, you sing, my father, you sing, my father sets you to the weariest work there is to do, and still you sing. There has never been singing in this castle or cat's or the smell of good cooking. It is the Lady Amalthea who, who causes this, and she causes me to ride out in the morning seeking danger. I was always a fair cook, Molly said milder, mildly, living in the greenwood with Collie and his men for seventeen years. Prince Lear continued as though she had not spoken. I want to serve her, as you do, to help her find whatever she has come here to find. I wish to be whatever she has most need of, tell her so. Will you tell her so? Even as he spoke, a soundless step sounded in, in his eyes, and the sigh of a satin gown troubled his face. The Lady Amalthea stood in the doorway. A season in King Haggard's chill domain had not dimmed or darkened her. Rather, the winter had sharpened her beauty until it invaded the beholder like a barbed arrow that could not be withdrawn. Her white hair was caught up with a blue ribbon, and her gown was lilac. It did not fit her well. Molly grew, who was an indif indifferent seamstress. The satin made her nervous, but the Lady Amalthea seemed more lovely for the poor work, for the cold stones and the smell of turnips. There was rain in her hair. Prince Lear bowed to her, a quick, crooked, wait a minute, crooked bow, as though someone had hit him in the stomach. My lady, he mumbled, you really should cover your head when you go out. Go out this go out this weather. Lady Malfi sat down at the table, and the little autumn colored cat immediately sprang up before her, purring swiftly and very softly. She put out her hand and the cat slid away, still purring. He did not appear frightened, but he would not let her touch his rusty fur. The Lady Amalthea beckoned, and the cat wriggled all over, like a dog, but he would not come near. Prince Lear said hoarsely, I must go. There is an ogre of some sort devouring village maidens two days' ride from here. It is said that he can be slain only by one who wields the great axe of Duke Alban. However, Duke Alban himself was one of the first consumed. He was dressed as a village, ma as a village maiden at the time, to deceive the monster, and there is little doubt who holds the great axe now. If I do not return, think of me. Farewell. Farewell, your highness, Molly said. The prince bowed again, and left the scullery on his noble errand. He looked back only once. You are cruel to him, Molly said. The Lady Amalthea did not look up. She was offering her open palm to the crooked, the, the crook-eared cat, but he stayed where he was, shivering with the, the desire to go to her. Cruel, she asked. How can I be cruel? 
This is for moral. This is for mort mortals. But then she did raise her eyes, and there was they were great with sorrow, and with something very near to mockery. She said, "So is kindness." Molly grew busied herself with the cooking pot, stirring the soup, and seasoning it, bustling numbly. In a low voice, she remarked, You might give him a gentle word, at the very least. He has undergone mighty trials for you. But what word shall I speak? asked the Lady Amalthea. I have said nothing to him. Yet every day he comes to me, and with more heads, more horns, and hides, and tails, more enchanted jewels, and bewitched weapons, what will he do if I speak? Molly said, He wishes you to think of, of him. Knights and princes, and princes rather, know only one way to be remembered, and not his fault. And it's not his fault. I think he does very well. Lady Amalthea turned her eyes to the cat again. Her long fingers twisted at the seam of her satin gown. No, he does not want my thoughts. She said softly. He wants me as much as the red bull did, and with no more understanding. But the but he frightens me even more than the Red Bull, because he has a kind heart. No, I, I will never speak a promise, a promising word to him. The pale mark on her brow was invisible in the gown, in, oh, in the gloom of the scullery. She touched it, and then withdrew her hand away quickly, as though the mark hurt her. The horse died, she said to the little cat. I could do nothing. Molly turned quickly and put her hands on the Lady Amalthea's shoulders. Beneath the sleek cloth, the flesh was cold and hard, as any stone in King Hagrid's castle. Oh, my lady! She whispered, that is because you are out of your true form. When you regain yourself, it will all return, all your powers, all your strength, all your sureness. It will come back to you. Had she dared, she would have taken the white girl in her arms and lulled her like a child. She had never dreamed of such a thing before. But the Lady of Mouthy answered, The magician gave me only the semblance of a human the semblance of a human being. The seeming. But not the spirit. If I had died then, I would still have been a unicorn. The old man knew the wizard. He said nothing in spite he said nothing to spite Haggard, but he knew of, its, uh, of itself, her hair escaped the blue ribbon and came hurrying down her neck and over her shoulder. The cat was all but won by this eagerness and lifted a paw to play with it. But then he drew back once more and sat on his haunches, tail curled around his front feet. Queer head to the side. His eyes were green speckled with gold. But that was long ago, the girl said. Now I, I am... Now I am to myself, and the and this other that you call my lady, for she is here as truly as I am now, though once she was only a veil over me. She walks in the castle, she sleeps, she dresses herself, she takes her meals, and she thinks her own thoughts. If she has no power to heal or to quiet, she still has another magic. Men speak to her saying Lady Amalthea, and she answers them, or, or she does not answer. The king is always watching her out of his pale eyes, wondering what she is, and the king's son wounds himself with loving her, and wonders who she is, and every day she searches the sea and the sky, the castle and the courtyard, the keep and the king's face, for something that she cannot always remember. What is it? What is it that she is seeking in this in this strange place? She knew a moment ago, but she has forgotten. She turned her face to Molly Group, and her eyes were not the unicorn's eyes. They were lovely still, but the but in a way they had the same. They had a name as a human. Okay. They were lovely still, but in a way that had a name, as a human woman is beautiful, their depth could be sounded and learned, and their degree of darkness was quite describable. 
Molly saw fear and loss and bewilderment when she looked into them and herself, and no, and nothing more. Unicorn, she said to herself, the Red Bull has driven them all away, all but you. You are the last unicorn. You came here to find the others and to set them free, and so you will. Slowly, the deep secret sea returned to the Lady Amalthea's eyes, filling them until they were as old and dark and unknown and unknowable and indescribable as the sea. Molly quickly Molly watched it happen and was afraid, but she gripped and the the bowed shoulder even more tightly as though her hands could draw despair like a, a lightning rod. And as she did so there shivered in the scullery floor a sound she had heard before, the sound like great teeth molars grinding together. The red bull was turning in his was turning in his sleep. I wonder if he dreams, Molly thought. The Lady of Malthea said, I must go to him. There is no other way and no time to spare. In this form or my own, I must face him again, even if all my people are dead and there is nothing to be saved. I must go to him before I forget myself forever. But I do not know the way, and I'm lonely. The little cat switched his tail and made an odd sound that was neither a meow nor a purr. Okay, wait a minute, just a sec. So the cat made a sound that was neither a meow nor a purr. Okay. I will go with you, Molly said. I don't know the way down to the Red Bull either, but there must be one. But there must be one. Smendrick will come too. He'll make make the way for us if we can't find it. I hope for no I I hope for no help from the magician, the Lady Mouthy replied disdainfully. I see him every day playing the fool for King Haggard, amusing him by his failures, by blundering at even the most trifling trick. He says that it is all he can do until his power speaks to him again, but it never will. He is no magician now, but the king's clown. Molly's face suddenly hurt her, and she turned away to inspect the soup again. Answering past, answering past the sharpness in her throat, she said, He is doing it for you. While you brood and mope and become someone else, he jigs and jests for Haggard, diverting him so that you may have time to find your folk, if they are to be found. But I cannot be long before the, but it can't be long before the king tires of him as he tires of all things, and cast him down to his dungeons or some place darker. You do, you do wrong to mock him. Her voice was as child's thin, sad mumble, she said, but that will never happen to you. Everyone loves you. They had a moment to look at each, to look at each other, the two women, the one fair and foreign in the cold, low room. The other appeared quite at home in such surroundings. An angry little beetle with her own kitchen beauty. Then they heard boots, scraping armor, clicking, and the gusty voices of old men. King, Hagger, King Haggard's four-minute arms came trooping into the, the scullery. They were all at least seventy years old, gaunt and limping, fragile as crusted snow but all clad from head to foot in King Haggard's miser, misery, miser, miserly mail, and bearing his wry weapons. They entered, hailing Molly Grew cheerfully, and asking what she had made them for supper. But at the sight of Lady Amalthea, I'm pretty sure that's... The four men became very quiet and bowed deep bows that made them gasp. My lady, said the oldest of the men, Command your servants. We are used we are used men, spent men, but if you would see miracles, you have only to request the impossible of us. We will become young again if you wish it so. His three com com comrades muttered their agreement. But the Lady Malchi whispered the answer, No, no, you will never be young again. Then she fled from them with her wild blinding hair hiding her face, and the satin gown hissing. How wise she is, the oldest man at arms declared. She understands that not even her beauty can do battle with time. It is a rare, sad wisdom 
for one so young. That soup smells delicious, Molly. It smells too savory for this place, the second man grumbled, as they sat as they all sat down around the table. Haggard hates good food. He says that no meal is good enough to justify all the money and effort wasted on preparing it. It, it is an illusion, says he, and an excuse. Live as I do, undeceived. Bra. He, sh he shuddered and grimaced, and the others laughed. To live like Haggard, said another man at arms, uh, as Molly spooned the steaming soup into his bowl. That will be my fate in the, in the next world, if I don't behave myself in this one. Why do you stay in his service, then, Molly demanded. She sat down with them and rested her chin on her hands. He pays you no wages, she said, and he feeds you as little as he dares. He sends you out in the worst weather to steal for him in, in Hagsgate, but he never spends a penny of the wealth in his strong room. He forbids everything from lights and to lutes, from fires to, f to fairs, and singing to, sin and sin and singing, to sinning, from books to and beer, and talk of spring to games you play with bits of string. Why not leave him? What in the world is there to keep you here? The four old men looked nervously at one another, coughing and sighing, and the first one said, It is our age. We're... Where else could we go? We are too old to be wandering the roads looking for work and shelter. It is our age, said the second man at arms. When you are old, anything that does not disturb you is a comfort. Cold and darkness and boredom long ago lost their sharp edges for us. But warmth, singing, spring, no, they would all be disturbances. There are worse things than living like Haggard. We will um, continue this um, in a future date, and we'll find out what the third man-at-arms has to say, and then the fourth. But in the meantime, we made it to page 113, so we are making progress. So, anyways, we have been reading from The Last Unicorn by Peter Beagle. If you... Um, like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring bells to know when I upload. And if you want to support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.